attention to this stuff. So while you're while you're in a session, you get a per diem. So for a sixty day mm-hmm. session, you get a per diem to cover your rentals and living expenses and food while you're down there, right? Yes, that's correct. And and I mean, I pay attention to that. I don't pay attention to Fred Albert's unwarranted criticism of uh, of a twenty thousand dollar a year job to serve the people of West Virginia. But, and you well, also apparently you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I just heard it as you guys spoke about. Yes, yeah. so. and there's a and there's a mileage reimbursement for those of us who live far away from the state capital. There, there is a mileage reimbursement for anyone that that drives to the capital. Obviously, the per diem uh, is, um, I, I believe, one hundred thirty one dollars a day currently, unless you uh, commute daily, uh, and that's a much lower rate of I think. 55 or, or somewhere along uh, somewhere around there point is you're not getting rich serving in the house of delegates or the legislature of any sort uh no in, in most cases there are there are a lot that, that a lot of us it probably costs money uh, to be here to be away from our businesses to be away from um you know other opportunities uh especially when you're four plus hours away so um, I, I think anyone that criticizes the legislature's salary clearly has no clue uh, as to the amount of work uh, that goes in um, you know, to do the job. And that's what we signed up for. Um, you know, none of and if you, if you didn't hear, Jason, to, to, put, to put it into context, I don't know that Fred was actively criticizing how much the money that you folks make because I think everybody's pretty realistic in the fact that $20,000 a year is not a handsome salary. Uh, his point was that in the two months you're in Charleston, you might make more than some of the uh, cooks, and I presume he meant some of the part-time cooks in the school system. Um, well, uh, I think was his and, point. And I think John Doyle explained it that yes. pretty well. Is that there's the fifteen thousand over the first three months of the year. Um, it, do, do some people make less than fifteen thousand dollars a year uh, as a state employee? They have to be part time. Um, yes. I, I, there, there's the, the math doesn't work that anybody that's working full time makes less than uh, twenty thousand dollars a year. Now, to other matters at hand, which includes uh, some important meetings that you've attended uh, very recently. I think yesterday, I believe you had one uh, in regards to uh, jails and and, uh, the money to pay for these uh, fixes that we need in the system. What can you tell us? Well, actually, the jails meeting is today. uh, And the the presentations that we're going to get today, uh, one is from the assistant uh, U.S. attorney from the Northern District uh, is going to present to us today. And then also Betsy Jividen. Uh, who is the former uh, commissioner of corrections uh, for a number of years, but now represents a company, or not a company, but a, but a, a, um, a nonprofit uh, called Uplift, Uplift West Virginia. And my understanding, based on some of the research their website, what little bit I know about them is that, that they um, are, are helping folks in uh, poor areas or, or, or folks that are that are struggling to get back on their feet, and, and so we're going to listen to them. And I, I'm sure they're, uh, what they're going to present to us today is, is probably a lot about reentry for those folks that were incarcerated and now have to reenter uh, the public. And, and, and obviously talking about resources that are available to them, mm-hmm. making sure that um, you know, they get back on the right track and um, you know, don't have, if, it's, if it's a drug issue, obviously you don't have a relapse or uh, some type of crime that we you – know, do, do what we can to, to keep them out of that situation. How many other counties around the state are as involved as Berkeley County is in dealing with some of these issues, Jason, like we have a day report center, for instance? There are a lot of counties that are served by a day report center. There are, I think, seven, some are six, seven that, that do not utilize a day report center. Um, I, I think that is a huge mistake on their part. Um, Berkeley County, I think, and Jefferson and, and Cabell, really, and a couple others. I don't, I don't mean to leave anyone out, but, but they're really the leaders in, um, in, in helping folks reenter, especially or, or those with substance abuse. Uh, they're the ones that are really taking the proactive approach and, and deserve a lot of credit. Uh, Cabell County, for example, had uh, one of the largest jail bills in the state um, and, and, and were unable to pay it, and now they um, – you know, have a, a jail bill that is low you know, on a per, per capita basis and uh, able to pay their jail bill and, uh, and and really doing a lot of good things there. Obviously, we all know uh, what a great job Berkeley County has done with their report with uh, the Recovery Resource Center. So there are counties doing those things. Um, when we talk about the jail bill and um, making sure that we 
have a fair system as to how we calculate the, the jail costs. And, you know, I think it's always important to, uh, whether it's this issue or another one, to help counties that help themselves. And, and I think that's, that was part of the reason for the jail bill change uh, last year is because those counties that are, that are investing money on the front end to get people help, um, you know, to make sure that they're, you know, there's an alternative sentencing for those people that were mad at, not people were scared of. You know, I think it's important to, to incentivize them to do those things. And, and the counties that refuse to do those things, um, they just think we ought to just lock everybody up. Now, we have jails for a reason, and there, there are people that should be locked up. Um, but at the same time, counties that, that aren't doing the necessary things to, to help out the community, I mean, I think they're, they're, you know, we should not incentivize or reward that behavior. You know, this is John Doyle. Full disclosure, about a month ago, I became a member of the board of the Jefferson Day Report Center, and I'm still learning about all this. But one of the things uh, that I learned very quickly is that we do, the Jefferson Day Report Center does a lot of work for about a half a dozen other counties uh, in terms of this type of activity. So, yeah, I, uh, uh, Jason's right that uh, there are probably about a half a dozen counties that have really thrown themselves into this uh, and m- many other counties that have a center but need help and about maybe a half a dozen that, that don't have one at all. Senator Jason Barrett is our guest here on the program. I, that, I'm assuming that was more of a statement than a question, though, John. It was. Yes, that's right. Okay. I just wanted to disclose that uh, I'm a member of that board. That's all. I, I didn't know that, by the way. I appreciate you doing what that's you're doing. That's why I did that. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Gilstrap. <laughs> Good morning, Senator. Um, morning. When we talk about incarceration rates and, and such, there's two sides to that equation. And the, there's the supply side and then the service side. On the supply side, in, in terms of the, the flow of of criminals into jails, whether they're people we're afraid of or people that we're mad at. Is there an effort to look at the body of existing laws at the, at the legislature level and perhaps decriminalizing some of the most common borderline criminal activities? Does that make sense? Some of the drug issues come to mind and I'm not full disclosure. I'm not at all familiar with, with, what the the metrics are for when a, a drug possession or whatever becomes becomes a crime, but it seems to me that if we find a way to decriminalize some of the issues that we're mad at, not afraid of, that we mm-hmm. we can have an impact on the jail problem. I don't know how many people we have locked up in West Virginia for possession of cannabis or marijuana, um, but it ought to be zero, uh, in my opinion, if it's simple possession. If it's somebody that's dealing, I think that's clearly a different different scenario. The legislature has, in the past few years, increased penalties for those folks that that clearly are distributing um, uh, very harsh drugs into the state. And I think we should continue to do that. Uh, However, I think that that what you're talking about is more of cannabis and um, that type of thing, where I I would agree that that we should um, decriminalize cannabis. I think that we um, you know, should, that should not be a Schedule One drug, uh, but it is, and and so, um, you know, I think that, like I said, there should be no one locked up for simple possession of marijuana, state. because now it's it's legal if you get a medical card, and um, you know, Ohio just legalized it for adult use, and um, you know, I think you know, you're going to see a bunch of tax revenue uh, go to Ohio for that. I think you're going to see a lot of people go over and purchase in in Ohio because they don't have to have a medical card and um yeah and 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 I'm not sp- specifically talking about drugs um although I think that gets caught into the into the uh, into the vortex of this but I mean just kind of across the board the uh it, it, looking at or hearing I haven't done the research I just we interview people here it seems that we have a disproportionate number of West Virginia citizens in, incarcerated as opposed to some of the neighboring states. Am I wrong about that? Um, I don't know if you're wrong or not. I, I don't have those numbers in front of me, John. I don't want to speculate incorrectly. Um, I, I think that we would be com- competitive or com- com- comparable <laughs> to, to other states. We, we may be a little higher. Um, you know, we certainly have, um, you know, serious drug problems in the state, and, and I don't I don't mean to discount those at all. Those those are incredibly important. Um, certainly those folks that, that bring uh, that garbage into the state should face a very uh, serious penalty for that. Um, 
so I, I think that if our if our population number, or I'm sorry, if our prison population is, is high compared to other states, I think it is centered around the drug problem. I don't I don't think it is centered around um, violent crimes and that those type of things because we just don't have uh, West Virginia. I don't believe has a lot of violent crime. Well, and if I'm elected king, the distribution of fentanyl, whether accidental or intentional, I think that's attempted murder and should be prosecuted as such. Sure. Again, a statement, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Congressman. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, Rob brought us on here to ask questions, not make statements, yeah. didn't you? It's, it's a guest or, like or Senator you, Barrett that's supposed to make statements. So You can casually observe if you have no questions. That's, <laughs> that's fine, too. I'll just ask them. You guys can drink coffee if that's what you want to do. I'm done my coffee. Yeah. Hey, uh, so Jason, what's next in regards to our situation with prisons? Uh, I know you're part of that committee. Well, I think that uh, there are certain things that we need to continue to look at as it relates to the jail bill, uh, things that uh, kind of are out of county control to some degree. And I know I've mentioned this before, but uh, one of the things that is, is a bit of a pet peeve of mine is that when someone is arrested uh, and bail is set by the magistrate or judge, uh, that that individual doesn't have the choice as to how they make bail. So if it's set uh, at a thousand dollars, uh, magistrates or judges can set, in instance, if it's a magistrate, they can say cash only, meaning you have to pay a thousand dollars to get out. And there are, and I'm not saying this happens a lot in in Berkeley County, um, but I am saying it happens uh, more frequent than it should in a lot of areas where the magistrate will set bail at a thousand dollars cash only, knowing that that individual cannot pay the thousand dollars. And these are these are crimes that they're. Uh, uh, have allegedly committed that in some cases have no jail time with them uh, if they're convicted and, and they'll set a thousand dollar five hundred dollar cash bail knowing that the individual can't pay it so they'll set in jail for two or three days the magistrate will then come back after that individual is set there for a few days and change it to a personal recognizance bond which allows them to leave and so essentially what this magistrate has done is created a penalty and penalized the accused before there was even a trial um and, and I, that number one is unfair to to someone that has just been accused and, and not convicted uh it raises a jail bill for the counties for for no reason so what i'm looking to do is allow the person that's accused to be able to put up property to put up cash or to use a bail bondsman and that be their option um as to, and some other states are, are moving towards that, but uh, I think it's a fairness issue. I think it, it, and a lot of these judges are saying and magistrates are saying, well, it's property only. Well, what if you don't own property? What if you can't convince mom or dad or grandma to put the property up for you, uh, but you have access to, you know, a bail bondsman? And, and, and you know, there are judges and magistrates that don't want to use bail bondsmen because they think it's a predatory nature of business. Well, it's that individual's choice in my opinion, to, to figure out how they, you know, if it's a thousand dollar bail, they get a bail bondsman. If they're willing to pay that hundred dollars, it's 10% fee. If they're willing to pay that hundred dollars and they know they don't get that money back, but they don't have to spend three or four nights in jail, that should be their choice to make. Well, I, I don't know how predatory bail bondsmen are when credit cards are charging 30% interest now. So, I, <laughs> well, that's right. well, I mean, it's been, you know, it, it, and they unfortunately get a bad rap at times because, um, you know, there it's like every industry, there are bad actors, but there are a lot of ones running legitimate small businesses, and we can't group them all together. But you, you know, a lot of these managers and judges are doing this uh, personal recognizance bonds only, where they just, you know, for example, there was one in uh, in a county very close to us that this person was accused of strangulation. Uh, and rape and, and other things, and they were out of state, and they let them out on their own personal recognizance, which I think is incredibly wow. dangerous and not smart. Um, they should have, uh, they should have, bail should have, a monetary bail should have been set. A person would have gotten a bail bonds, but they don't show up. The bail bondsman goes and ensures they do show up. And, you know, the, the, the government entity, whether it's the county sheriff or whoever, they, they don't have the resources and ability to, to go all over the country looking for someone. Um, but if the bondsman, uh, doesn't go find that person, and they lose the money they put up. 
Mr. Doyle. Yeah, uh, Jason, this is John Doyle, I, and I agree with you on that completely. Uh, uh, d- uh, on a related question involving corrections, do you see any chance that anybody uh, who's been uh, involved with the Department of Corrections uh, and Rehabilitation uh, uh, is going to end up uh, in court and maybe convicted of a crime? I don't know the answer to that. I know there have been a few people that have been terminated um, uh, in in response to uh, some of the things that have, have come out in regards to the lawsuit at Southern. As mm-hmm. you know, John, uh, Betsy Jividen, who was presenting to the committee today, uh, is the former commissioner of corrections and was for a number of years. So she will be before our committee today. So um, we might get off topic a little bit, and I might be able to ask her a few questions about uh, what she knows, what her involvement could have been or, or was during the, uh, during her, her time and, and what some of the procedures were um, as it relates to the conditions at, at Southern Region Jail. It's, it's, it's cost the state some money, what they've done. $4 million is what this uh, lawsuit yeah. uh, settlement is, and that's $4 million of, of taxpayer money. And, right. Um, right. As I understand it, we've. Really don't take that lightly. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, we've recovered those documents, right? They were found. What's in them? Uh, I think what's in them is uh, re- there are reports of of conditions that uh, were substandard, and um, there's a certification agency uh, that West Virginia uh, had certification, and it, it deals with uh, corrections and and conditions and corrections and West Virginia lost that certification a number of years ago. And, you know, I think that there were a lot of folks that there's a lot of folks. There were, there were folks within corrections that, that knew what was going on, that, that had reports of these conditions, um, but really didn't share that above, uh, above them. And, and, and I think that's the reason that, you know, some of this is, is going on. When this lawsuit was first drawn up, a lot of folks said that a lot of this was exaggeration, that this attorney really uh, wasn't uh, stating a lot of facts, that were just kind of hoping to get a better settlement. And there was a very dismissive attitude about potentially terrible conditions in this jail. Uh, was that the wrong attitude to take, Jason? Is there still some truth to that? Did the state settle too quickly? Uh, I don't have all the details as to either the state settling too quickly. Um, uh, to, to to make a determination or an opinion on that, um, I do think that some of the uh, dismissive attitude uh, was brought by um, the folks that were in charge, but didn't share. They were in charge of a certain level, uh, but didn't share that information with the cabinet secretary. Didn't share that uh, the, that information with the governor's office, uh, and who just dismissed it uh, when these reports were coming out. Okay, finally, if I don't ask you about a Tudor's update, uh, our Facebook uh, community will go into semi-riot. So what's the latest on opening your Tudor's? Uh, very, very soon. Uh, the inside is we have the equipment set. We are extremely close. Um, so it's just it's we're, we're down to days, really, and not uh, not really? necessarily weeks and months anymore. So. so possibly by Thanksgiving Day? I might be a little optimistic, but... Not very long after that. All right. Biscuits and I gravy for November. November. Last time I was on, I'm sticking to that. So. <laughs> well, we are in November. So, Jason, thank I'm you aware. very much. I, Appreciate I, I, it. Hey, guys. Thank you. Take care. Absolutely.